God is still calling people to hard places. Hard places and to stay in hard places. And whenever we give to the Lottie Moon offering to support uh, the International Missions Board, we're helping to help others who are called to go to really, really hard places and do really hard things um, to fulfill God's calling on their life. And so as I've said before, not all of us are called to go to those hard places uh, all over the world, but we are called to pray and support those who are called. Right. And so let's make sure that we are doing our part. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, grab your Bibles now and open them if you haven't already to 1 John chapter 4. Uh, this morning as we are at week 4 of Advent, we are it's Christmas Eve as many of you already uh, know that and we're looking forward to celebrating uh, Christmas Day uh, tomorrow and but this morning we're going to look at 1 John chapter 4, uh, uh, just uh, three verses, verses 9 to 11, as we look at the, the love of, of Christmas, or, or more specifically, we're going to be looking at uh, the love that God gave to the world on that first Christmas, a, a love that is available uh, for all people or to all people, a, a love that is for every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that really what Christmas is all about? Right, as we've been talking about that all this this past uh, three weeks leading up to today and, and even in a Sunday school hour and hopefully uh, some of your own discussions with your family that, that sometimes we, we get so distracted by everything out, uh, else that's going on, the, the traditions that we hold. And, and again, like I said, that's not they're not bad things, but we must not lose focus of why we celebrate Christmas. What are we doing at Christmas time? See, whether we realize it or not, we're all desperate for God's love all the time. The whole world is. They, they may not realize it, but they are desperate for God's love as well. And, and unfortunately, uh, many, if not most people, don't really understand what love is. Not, not true love, anyway. And, 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 and that being the case, uh, you know, they don't understand what God's love is, is either. Right? They don't know what, what, understand what love is, much less what God's love is. So if we have a wrong understanding about that, if we have a wrong understanding of love, we'll have a wrong understanding of God's love too. If we, if we believe that love is always and only transactional, which many people do, right? Been trained that way to think that way about love, that, that we must do something to be loved, right? You understand what I'm saying there? That, there, there's, that we, we must perform something or do something before someone will love us or so that we can receive love. If that's what we've been trained to think that way, to, to, to believe that way, we'll believe that we must do something to be loved by God. But that's not true, is it? Not if, not if we believe the Word of God, not what the Bible tells us. God's love is, is not just His response to something that we do. In other words, He doesn't love us because of what we do or the good works that we do. Love is, is, is who God is. And that is why He loves us the way that He does. And in fact, that is why He loves the world the way that He does. It doesn't make any sense. I've quoted John Piper regarding God's love before. I've used this quote and it's so good I'll probably use it again. And so if you feel like you've heard this before, it's because you have. <laughs> He compares God's love with heat from fire and light from the sun. He says, love is from God the way heat is from fire or the way light is from the sun. Love belongs to God's nature. It's woven into what He is. It's part of what it means to be God. The sun gives light because it is light and fire gives heat because it is heat. And so continuing with that same logic, God gives love because God is love. What 1 John 4 8 tells us. So while it's true that God is love and that God is always demonstrating his love towards us, we don't always recognize it, do we? We, we don't always receive his love for us. I believe there's even times when we're tempted to question whether God loves us at all. Right? The, the seasons of life get hard and, and, and difficulties come, and, and it just we seem to be not able to find any relief, and we keep praying and asking God to deliver us. And we keep praying and ask God to, to bring the healing. And it, it seems like the, our prayers aren't going past the ceiling. And, and it's in those moments where 
the enemy will attack and the enemy will begin to tell you, you see, you say that your God loves you. If he loves you so much, then why isn't he answering your prayers? If your God loves you so much, then why is he, why is he allowing this type of stuff to go on, these hard things that you're dealing with? And sometimes we question God's love for us. See, even if it's only in our, in our heads that we do this, and why is he letting these things happen? Why is he answering our prayers? Why, why is there going to be an empty chair at Christmas dinner this year that wasn't empty last year? You see, that's a reality that that's a lot of people are dealing with this year. Mm -hmm. To be sure, Christmas is a time of hope. It's a time of peace. It's a time of joy. It's a time of love. But Christmas is also a time of grief for many people. And we need to be mindful of that this time of year and give them space to be able to grieve in a way that's fitting for them. But as God's people, we're aware that we live in a fallen world, or at least we should be. We, we understand that, that bad things happen, right? That we, we're uh, sinful people. We live in a, a fallen world that, that, is, that is damaged by sin. Bad things can happen to anyone, even, even believers. We know that anyone can be killed in an in a automobile accident unexpectedly, right? Even believers, believers aren't exempt. Anyone can be diagnosed with cancer. Again, believers aren't exempt. Anyone can go to sleep perfectly healthy and never wake up again, wake up and see Jesus, right? Believers aren't exempt from these things. Anyone can lose their job at no fault of their own. Believers aren't exempt from any of this. And so why do I bring all this up? You're saying, Brother Mike, this is Christmas. This is Christmas. Well, where, where's the, the Christmas joy in all this? So this is about understanding love. God's love for us. Not, not, all, not all prettied up the way we like to make it. We need to understand God's love for us. When we think of, we're reminded of these hard things that happen, the reality of life, everything I just mentioned, Everyone in this room has experienced these to some extent, either personally or you know someone that has. Our consequences cannot dictate God's love for us. Right. They cannot. They must never base, we must never base God's love for us off of our circumstances. You see, God's love for us is not based off of what happens to us or what doesn't happen to us. God's love for us is based off of who He is. It's based off of who He is. It's God's love for us is spelled out for us again and again all throughout the pages of Scripture. In fact, I would say it's, it's appropriate. Uh, the, the Bible has been called lots of things and a book of instructions so we can live in godliness and righteousness. But I would also say that it's appropriate to say that, that the Bible is God's love letter. It's a love letter to, to us, to the world. It tells us about the extent of His love and how we can experience the fullness of His love through believing in His Son, Jesus Christ. Nowhere is this clearer than John 3, 16 and 17. We, we look at this verse almost weekly to remind us of God's love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You see, the extent of God's love for us is that He was willing to, to give His only begotten Son for us. Not that He had many sons, He had one Son. Right. And He was willing to give that one Son to, to sacrifice for us. That's what we're celebrating tomorrow. That's what we're talking about today, right? The, that's why Christians celebrate Christmas. That God gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross and to be raised from the dead three days later to pay the price for our sins. That, that's what Christians celebrated Easter, right? That Christmas is part one. Easter is, is part two, right, of His redemption plan for the world. The only way that we can experience the fullness of God's love for us is by believing in His Son and what He has accomplished for us through His death and resurrection. And so as I like to do as we work through the the text and as we build up to where we're going, I like to pause and ask questions because questions make us think about where we are. It's, it's one thing to receive information and hear God's Word and hear it explained, but sometimes we need to pause and, 
and, and answer some questions. It's like, yeah, I agree with all that. That sounds wonderful. That sounds right. But, but, but let me just pause and ask, have you experienced the fullness of God's love personally for your life? Have you believed in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Are you experiencing the fullness of God's love in your life right now? You know, not like what I did one time, but I, I, I can't honestly say that I'm really experiencing it right now. You see, let me give a little clarity to these questions. I'm not asking you if you're healthy and wealthy. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm not even asking you if you're happy with your circumstances because I can go around this room and and, and somebody is, is not going to be really happy with some aspect. You know, I don't know anybody that's perfectly content in everything. Right? right? We all, there's all, all of us have something that we, we wish was a little different with our circumstance. That's not what I'm asking you either. I'm asking if you're resting in your reconciliation with God through your faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. That's, that, that's what I'm talking about. Experiencing the love of God that way, resting in that, resting in God's love for you. So, so what does that mean? It means that, that we know that we're loved by God beyond what we can comprehend. Beyond what we can comprehend. It doesn't make any sense, uh, regardless of what our circumstances might be, because God loves His children. And He knew that there would be times like this. There would be times when we struggle with recognizing and remembering his love. He knows us inside and out. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knew we had struggled with this. He knew that the enemy would try to deceive us and tempt us into doubting God's love for us. And so I think that's that's probably why God's Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write what he did in Romans 8, verses 35 to 39, and other passages that we, we read often, keep it before us. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, as the people of God, we need to remember this. Right. We need to remember this promise from God. Never forget it. Hold on to it dearly. Cherish it as a prized possession. You see, we're loved by God and nothing and nobody can ever, ever, ever separate us from His love. So I'll just say to you, Merry Christmas, Merry church. Christmas. God loves you. God loves you. He always has and He always will. Yeah. Maybe you're sitting here this morning, I don't know, Brother Mike, I'm just, I'm just not feeling the love this year. Well, if you don't believe that God loves you, perhaps that will change before you leave here this morning. I hope that it does. I pray that uh, so let's let's stand together if you're able to as we honor the reading of, of God's word this morning. First John chapter four, verses nine through eleven. John John begins there in verse nine. In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Mm. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Mm. This is God's Word. Father in Heaven, we thank You so much for this Christmas Eve day. To be able to gather with Your, your church, gather with Your people today, Father, as we are reminded of the great love that You have for us, the great love that You have for the whole world. And Father, I, I pray that, that this love would encourage us today. That this, this, this love that you have for us would sustain us today. And Father, I pray that you would help us to be messengers, help us to be ambassadors of this love. And, and this love that you sent has a name, the name above all names, the name Jesus Christ. And so Father, thank you for Jesus. 
Thank you for sending your only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Mm -hmm. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In the Greek language that's used in our New Testament, there are, are three different words or three different types of love that are given. And most of you already know this. I'm not telling you anything you probably haven't heard before, right? Uh, there's eros, there's phileo, and there's also agape. Uh, eros is kind of the, the sensual love or the uh, erotic type love, the sexual love. Uh, phileo is the uh, brotherly love. That's the type of love that we have for our friends and, and family members. And then the, the, the last one, the one that's pertaining to our, our text today, uh, is the agape love. That's the kind of love that God has for us and the way that we are to have love for others, right? Agape love is an, an unconditional love. It, it's an I love you no matter what kind of love. If you're if you're married and you have children, or if you have grandchildren, you kind of you're kind of familiar with this type of love. You may not call it agape love, but that's it's very similar in a, in the same way, right? Agape love is the, the kind of love that God has for you and for me. In a particular interest, of, every time that we see love mentioned in our passage, that's what He's talking about. That that's the the, the type of love that he has for us. So let me just read it again and, 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 and include unconditional, unconditionally before it and just kind of make, make, help you to see uh, how it stands out when I read it again. It says, In this the unconditional love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is unconditional love. Not that we unconditionally loved God, but that He unconditionally loved us and sent His Son to be the perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, if God so unconditionally loved us, we also ought to unconditionally love one another. It makes a difference, doesn't it? When you, when you think about it that way, when we, when we read it, that's the kind of love that He has for us. And so now that we've defined what kind of love God ha loves us with, that He has for us, as his sons and his daughters, his children, uh, we'll be able to, to see more clearly the, a, a few truths, three truths regarding the love of Christmas. The first truth that we see is that God's love has been sent into the world. All right, verse 9, In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Verse 9 is, is quite remarkable, isn't it? Right? It's a remarkable verse because the love of God is not what we would expect to see being manifested towards His enemies. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. You know, that, that uh, love is not something that comes to mind when I, I think about someone who has wronged me or someone that has openly uh, said that they hate me uh, or, 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 or has, is my enemy. They despise me. And, and love is not the first thing that comes to my mind, much less an unconditional type of love. But that's the type of, that's what he manifested towards us. You say, well, that's his enemies. You know, I'm not his enemies. Well, either, either, maybe you're not now if you're a believer. You're not. But before you trusted Christ, that's exactly who you were. You were his enemies. That's what our sins have made us in God's sight, and that's not a good thing to be. Do you know what God's record is when he is confronted by his enemies? You know what his record is? He's He's undefeated. He, he, he has a loss. He, he don't lose. He never loses. He's undefeated. The pages of our Old Testament are filled with God defeating or totally wiping out the enemies of His people. I, I think the one that stands out to me most is Pharaoh and his armies as they were swallowed up in the Red Sea, right? That's what happens to his enemies or that's what can happen to his enemies. Even though there have been many times that God has manifested His wrath towards His enemies, there have been many more times uh, where He has been gracious. Right? We, we think of those stand out where he, His judgment has come, but, but, but there's been many more occasions where His grace abounded. There have been countless times when God would have been justified in manifesting His wrath towards His enemies, and yet there have also been countless times that 
He has chosen to withhold or delay His wrath towards His enemies. How do I know that? How, how do we know that? How can we know that this morning? Because the plant hasn't been destroyed yet. Even though we continually are told that we're killing the planet and we're going to destroy the planet and all these things, but the planet remains. Also, we know because we're here this morning and life is going on like usual all around us. But also because I know that God is primarily known as the God of love, not the God of wrath. Right? right? He's known as the God of love, not the God of wrath. First John 4, 8 says, God is love and not God is wrath. And praise the Lord for that. Amen? Right. <laughs> That's something to be joyful about. We should be thankful that He is... He is known for being a God of love, not a God of wrath. And because God is love, He is long-suffering towards His enemies. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what promise was Peter referring to here? That's important to know, isn't it? Right? The promise. The, the promise of eternal condemnation of his enemies. The, the eternal condemnation of those who refuse to come to repentance. The eternal condemnation of those who reject the love of God which was manifested towards them when God sent his only begotten son into the world that first Christmas. So why did God do that? Why did he do that? So that his enemies could be his enemies no longer. To make peace so that instead of perishing in their sins, they might live through Him. Live through Him. Live through who? Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Through Jesus, His only begotten Son. So, so why do we as Christians make such a big deal about Christmas? Have, have you ever been asked that by somebody? Right? Maybe whenever you're kind of talking about some things with co-workers or family members and, and maybe... They're so excited about all the different, the pretty lights and this, that, and the other. Or, or maybe they're some of those people that, that, that don't believe in Christmas and they want to be happy holidays. And so you get in these discussions with people and you got to push back on that some. Like, why why do y'all make such a big deal? Why do y'all make such a fuss that we say Merry Christmas and not Happy Holidays or Xmas or whatever? Why, why do y'all make such a fuss about that? Because without Christmas we would have no hope, that's why. Right. Without Christmas, we'd have no peace. Without Christmas, we'd have no joy. Because Christmas is when the love of God was manifested towards us. That's why it's a big deal. That's why it matters to us. Because Christmas is when we celebrate the fact that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Think of it this way, maybe. Because of what happened that first Christmas, you can have hope. You can have peace. You can have joy. You can have love. Mm -hmm. Because of what happened that first Christmas, you can have everlasting life through believing in Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. That's why we make such a big deal about Christmas. God's love has been sent into the world, but more specifically, God's love has been sent, into the, sent to you and to me, that we might live through Him. Right? Personalize it. Personalize Scripture. Instead of saying the world all the time, personalize it for yourself. The love of God was sent to you. Right. The love of God was sent to me. See, the birth accounts of Jesus, they're found in Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel. And we looked at Luke's account in the Sunday school hour. Some of us looked at it a little closer than, than others, I believe. <laughs> the bell didn't ring. <laughs> right? Good Bible study. We looked at it in Sunday school hour, and, and then I preached on it last, last Sunday. I know y'all slept six times or whatever since then, but we've already looked at that one. So I want to just take a moment and, and read Matthew's birth account because it might be the only time that you read it or hear it read until next Christmas. And so it's, it's worth us taking a second to, to read it together here. Beginning Matthew 1, verse 18 to 25. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. 
Then Joseph, her husband, being a, a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for what for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. You see, church, God's love has been sent into the world. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Number two, the second truth that we see is that God's love saves sinners. Verse 10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that, that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our, our sins. Uh, I know I've seen, that you've seen uh, those those t-shirts, you know, we don't see them as much as we used to anymore because we don't have Lifeway anymore because Lifeway is the one where you would, these Christian t-shirts and some of the things that they had were, were kind of cheesy, kind of corny. And you may have seen the one that, that said, a blood donor saved me. Have y'all seen that one before? Y'all familiar with that one? I, 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 I've seen it before. And, and I know it's kind of cheesy, but, but guess what? It's really good theology. Right? It's really, it's really good theology. Uh, I, I, like to always, I like to always kind of, when we talk about God's love and, and, and dealing with this matter like we're talking about this morning, it's always helpful for us to kind of be reminded of the the hopeless condition that we were once in, right? right? That, that's what makes the good news the good news, right? We were in bad shape before the, the good news turned our lives around, transformed us. We, you see, we weren't just sick in our sins. We were dead in our sins is what the Bible says. We weren't just struggling in our sins. We were slaves to our sins. But Jesus finished work on the cross, saved our souls from eternal destruction, and set us free from the bondage of sin in our lives. John 10.10 10 tells us that Jesus came so that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. Right. And John 8.36 tells us that if the Son makes us free, we are free indeed. You see, it's Christmas morning and we, we like to think about that sweet baby Jesus that's lying in that manger and all the, the animals are there and the heavenly host and we just... That's the vision that we have. And so we, we hate to think about on Christmas Day the purpose of Jesus, what, what His life would fulfill. We hate to think of it this way. But, but He was born for one reason. He was born for one reason, one reason only. To die on the cross for the sins of the world. That was it. That's the only reason that He came down from heaven. The whole purpose for Jesus being born was to die for the sins of everyone that would ever Place their faith in Him. Imagine if you can, you can to, to know that your entire existence is to be despised. Mm -hmm. Right? Because He is fully God. He knows all things. He knows He's going to be hated. He knows He's going to be rejected. He's going to be despised. He, he's going to be cursed. He's going to be mocked. He's ultimately going to be nailed to the cross to suffer and die for the sins of the world. For Again, personalize it for my sins, for your sins. That's what Jesus lived with in the back of his mind his entire life. How could he live like that? Right? That's, sometimes I wonder how, how could he do that? Why, why would he allow all that to happen to him? Right? That's, that's some good questions. Those are, that's, how, that's how our minds work, but that's not how the mind of Christ works, thank goodness. Why would he do all that? Because it's who he is. Right? It's who He is. God is love and, and Jesus is God. Right. He is the Son of God, but yet He is still fully God. The fullness of God's love was manifested in the death of Jesus on the cross. In His Gospel, John said this, said it like this in John 15, 13, 
It says, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. For his friends. Right? Not talking about enemies here, his friends. Verse 10 makes it clear that God initiated the relationship with you and me. It was unprompted. It was unconditioned. Right? We didn't find God. God found us. We weren't seeking after God. God was seeking after us. I think about one of the descriptions of some of the, the church growth movements these last few decades. The, the seeker-sensitive church. What, what is that? Right? Because we see from God's Word itself that God is the one seeking us. Right? We're not seeking Him. That, that, that we respond to Him coming after us. He's seeking us. According to the scriptures, we were dead in our sins. Dead people don't seek God. Right. Dead people do anything. You know why? Because they're dead. That's the point. Our sin had made us unacceptable to God. All have sinned. All of us have failed God. All of us have sinned and fallen short of His glory. You see, the hard truth is God's standard for us is sinless perfection. Not just, not just being good people or good moral people or kind of measuring up. Because sometimes that's what we'll do. Is like, uh, compared to that person, I'm a pretty good person. Well, that's you're looking at the wrong standard. Again, Christ is our standard. God is the one that set the standard, but, but He also provided a sinless substitute for you and for me. God knew from eternity past that we would be sinners. And God already had a, a plan in place. So aren't you thankful for that? Jesus' death on the cross was always the plan. There, and there, there is no other plan. There is no plan B. You see, many people have tried to place blame for the death of Jesus. They'll blame the Romans for, for his death because they're the ones who, you know, that, that, that drove the nails and the whole art of crucifixion. They're responsible. They're, they're the ones that, that killed Jesus. Some will blame the Jews for his death. They're the ones that plotted and schemed and all the different things. And they're the ones that demanded that, that Pilate crucify him. They could have had Barabbas, but they said, no, we want Jesus crucified, this man. And then some well-meaning believers, they'll even, we'll blame ourselves. That, that our, our sins, our sins are what killed Jesus. But they and us, we were all wrong about this. According to Isaiah 53, God the Father is to blame for the death of Jesus. Did you know that? That God the Father is the, the blame for the death of Jesus. And for time's sake, I'll just read the verses dealing with Jesus being punished for our sins, for Jesus being our propitiation. Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then verses 10, 10 through 12. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge of my righteous. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he has numbered, was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Verse ten, the the New American Standard is, is a little more accurate. Uh, I'm not I'm not a big fan of the New American Standard. Leslie loves it, but I don't I don't care for it that that much. It's kind of like Yoda speak to me. I know what I'm talking about. The word order is kind of hard for me to read, but anyway, I, I agree with it here. I like it here. Verse 10 says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. Not just bruise him, crush him, putting him to grief. 
You see, the Romans and the Jews were used to accomplish the death of Jesus. That's all. They were tools. They were a means to an end. Our sins were the reason that Jesus' death was necessary in the first place. But God the Father is the one that's ultimately responsible for the death of Jesus, right? The only begotten, His only begotten Son. And so why would God do that for sinners like us? Why would God do that for His enemies? Because He loves us. Because He loves us, He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's what verse 10 says. That's what God's Word tells us here. God's wrath towards our sin was fully satisfied in the death of Jesus on the cross. That's what propitiation means. It's, it's the appeasement of or the satisfaction of, of wrath. Our sin had to be punished to both satisfy God's wrath and uphold His righteousness. Wayne Grudem put it this way. He says in the cross we have a clear demonstration of the reason God punishes sin. If he did not punish sin, he would not be a righteous God, and there would be no ultimate justice in the universe. But when sin is punished, God is showing himself to be a righteous judge over all, and justice is being done in the universe. See, Jesus willingly took our place because he alone could satisfy God's justice. Right. Nobody else could do this but him. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't accomplish that. They were just shadows and symbols, forerunners of what the perfect Lamb of God would ultimately do. Only a sinless human can atone for sinful humans. Only the sinless Son of God can meet that requirement. Mm -hmm. So church, when we begin to, to question or even doubt God's love for us, all we need to do is remember the cross to remind us of how much God loves us. Mm -hmm. Remember the cross. Remember His sacrifice. Remember His propitiation for our sins. God's love has been sent into the world. God's love saves sinners. And number three, the final truth that we see is that God's love is to be shared with others. Shared with us. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This last point won't take very long. It shouldn't. If God is love, then it only makes sense that God's people will be loving people. If God is love, it only makes sense that God's people will be loving people. That's one of the, 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 the issues at hand. That's one of the things that the church has not done well with. That's one of the criticisms of the church, isn't it? Some, it's, sometimes it's that we're hypocr hypocrites and we are. Sometimes it's that we're judgmental people and, and we are. But it's also been said that sometimes that church isn't very loving. That those people don't really love each other. Or, or they don't love the community. They just kind of keep to themselves. And guess what? That's also true sometimes, isn't it? But if God is a God of love, God's people should be loving people. Now, to be clear, all people will... All people... People will... All people are capable... Of love. But the agape love that we see here in our passage is unique to God's people. That's why God's people look for opportunities to, to, to be loving people or to love on people or to demonstrate love towards others. And, and again, to be clear, not just our friends, not just our family members, but sometimes we, we do that for complete and total strangers, don't we? Not everybody does that. That's what God's people do. In fact, loving all people is the second greatest commandment given to us in God's Word. Matthew 22, 36-40 says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So, so Jesus, to be clear, you say, sometimes we'll say, well, I just, I, I, I struggle with it. I, I don't know if I can, I can love like that. I don't, know if I, I don't know if I can do this. You see, Jesus would not command us to do something that he would not enable and empower us to do. Mm -hmm. If God commands us to do something, he's going to make a way for us to be able 
to do what He has commanded us to do. So how do we do this? How do we love one another? We love one another the same way that Jesus loved people in the Gospels, right? We All these different examples that we see, we that, that, that Jesus loved people by serving them and by meeting their needs, right? Tangible ways of, of doing this. See, he loved people by being a, a friend to the those who had no friends, the, the ones who were despised and rejected, the ones who were outcast. He made it a point to be friendly towards them and be friendly with them. He loved people by praying for and with people that were in need. He loved people by being gracious and forgiving of others. For just, just being kind, as I've often said here. That's, you can't do anything else. You don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. Just be kind. Just be kind. That's how we love people, the way Jesus did. Do you know what the most loving thing that Jesus did for people? Maybe the most loving thing that we can do for people, for people too? Jesus loved people by giving them the good news that He was the promised Messiah. Mm -hmm. That's the most loving thing that He did for people. He loved people by inviting them to come to Him for rest, for the weariness of their souls. Matthew 11, 28-30 says, Come to Me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and lowly and hard, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, church, at Christmas we are reminded that Christ has come into the world and that He is still inviting the lost to come to Him to experience His love and have rest for their souls. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the great opportunity that we have at Christmas time to tell others about this love that God has for us, this, this rest that is, is being offered to us to them, for their souls, to have peace, to have joy, to have hope, to have this love. As the people of God, what I've come to, to, to understand, that our ability to love is, is almost going to run parallel with our spiritual growth. The more we grow to be like Jesus, the more we're going to be able to love people the way Jesus loved people. We will become more loving towards others. Because the more we understand the extent of God's love for us, the more compelled we will be to love one another like God has loved us. So, so what is the, the love of Christmas? What does it mean? How, how do we apply the love of Christmas to our everyday lives, right? Not just at Christmas time, but all year long. We see this, right? God's love has been sent into the world. God's love saves sinners. God's love is to be shared with others. That's, that's how we do this. That's the good news that we have to share with others. So this morning as I wrap up, I share this quote with you from Danny Aiken regarding this passage. He says, when we were in darkness, God sent his light. When we were dead, God sent his life. When we were in sin, God sent his son. When we were in despair, God sent his love. I would just ask you again this morning, have you received God's love yet? All right, that's that's the, the gift. And even Stacy this morning, he pointed out to the men's class that yes, there is God loves us, and God has given us given us his son, but yet we must receive him. It's a gift. As if I were to say this this bottle of water is for you. There it is for you. Does you no good sitting here on this pulpit, does it? Right. It only does benefits you when you take possession of that bottle and you open it up and drink its contents. Same way with God's love for us, with God's gift of His Son. Same thing, same premise. We must receive God's love. We must receive God's Son. John 3.16 tells us that God gave us His only begotten Son because He loved us. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas time. Or at least it should be what we're celebrating. But the only way that we can experience God's greatest expression of His love for us is by believing in His Son Jesus and what He's accomplished for us through His death and resurrection. And you might be sitting here this morning or some, some might be watching from home and you're saying, well, that, that all sounds great, Brother Mike, but you just don't know 
what I've done. You, you don't know the horrible things that I've done, the horrible things I've said, even things I've said about God, things I've said about Jesus, things I've said about the church. I've, I've done and said horrible things. There's no way that God can love me. There, there, there's, there's, there's no way that He could ever forgive me. I, I, I don't deserve God's love. And if you're waiting for me to, 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 to disagree with you, I'm not. Because I won't. Because you don't deserve it. I didn't deserve it either. Nobody deserves it. That's the point. Right? That's why God's love for us is an unconditioned love. So have, have you? Right? Have you done this? Have, how can you receive God's love? How can you be saved from the power and the penalty of your sins? You must admit that you're a sinner. You must come to grips with who you are, with the reality of who you are, apart from Christ. That you are a sinner and asking for forgiveness. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God has raised Him from the dead. And then confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and make it public. Right? Don't, don't be ashamed. Don't be some closet follower of Jesus. Let somebody know. Can anyone receive God's love? Can anyone be saved? Yes and yes. Yes and yes. John 3, 16 and 17. Again, we've already read it once. We'll look at it again. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God not sent His Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through Him might be saved. And then Romans 10, 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever. Whoever. Can anyone receive God's love? Can anyone be saved? Romans 10, 13 says, whoever. Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For our brothers and sisters in Christ that are here this morning, we have been reminded of these truths today. These, these critical truths, these vital truths regarding God's love for us. Much needed at Christmas time because we're busy like everybody else. And we got other things to do like everyone else. And, and some of us, even your pastors, got things to do when I leave here. We're going to pack up and we're going to head to Baton Rouge to be with our family. There's lots of things to do. And so we need to be reminded of these truths. We must be anchored in these truths before we get swept away by all the other things there are to do. God's love has been sent into the world. Jesus has been sent into the world. He has already come. God's love saves sinners. As that great song says, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And lastly, God's love is to be shared with others. If God so loved us, we, ought to, ought, we also ought to love others one another. So this Christmas, as you gather with friends and, and gather with family, uh, later this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow, the next few days, let's make sure that we let everyone know why we celebrate Christmas. And let's, let's share the love of God with those who don't know the love of God. Amen? Amen. Right, let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for forgiving your son, manifesting uh, love towards us, demonstrating love towards us. And God, I pray that, that you would help each one of us, Father. Help us to, to, to tell others today, tell others this afternoon, tell others tonight, tell others tomorrow. Uh, the next day, the next day, the next day, all day, uh, uh, every day, all year long, about the, the love that you have for the world. And that, that this love that you have for us has a name, the name of Jesus, your only begotten Son. That if they would believe in Him, that they would repent of their sins and believe in Him, believe in, in the work that He accomplished on the cross, His death and resurrection to to make forgiveness possible, then they can be forgiven. 
They can be reconciled with you. They can have everlasting life. They can experience the full extent of your love for them. God, help us to do that. And Father, as your sons and your daughters, help us to, to, to cherish that love that you have for us. Help us to, to walk in the love that you have for us. Help, help us to rest in the love that you have for us. God. God, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for giving us your son, Christ. The greatest expression of your love for us that you could possibly give us. And help us to live in a, in a way that's a proper response. Help us to love you the way that you deserve to be loved. Help us to be obedient. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.